Act One of the Imaginary Invalid by Moliere, translated by Charles Heron Wall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Imaginary Invalid by Moliere, translated by Charles Heron Wall. Persons represented. Argon, read by Alan Johns. Beline, read by Nadine Gert Boulet. Angelique, read by Ariel Lipshaw. Louison, read by Elizabeth Clatt. Berald, read by Delmar H. Dolbier. Cleante, read by M. B. Mr. Diafoiru, read by Vupahipo. Thomas Diafoiru, read by Dustin Tuttle. Mr. Pergen, read by Bologna Times. Monsieur Fleurent, Monsieur de Bonifoy, read by Alan Mapstone. Toinette, read by Abaye. Narration by Todd. The Imaginary Invalid, Act One. Scene One. Argon, sitting at a table, adding up his apothecary's bill with counters. Three and two make five, and five make ten, and ten make twenty. Item. On the twenty-fourth, a small, insinuative clyster, preparative and gentle to soften, moisten, and refresh the bowels of Mr. Argon. What I like about Mr. Florent, my apothecary, is that his bills are always civil. The bowels of Mr. Argon. All the same, Mr. Florent, it is not enough to be civil. You must also be reasonable and not plunder sick people. Thirty sous for a cloister. I have already told you, with all due respect to you, that elsewhere you have only charged me twenty sous. And twenty sous, in the language of apothecaries, means only ten sous. Here they are, these ten sous. Item. On the said day, a good detergent cloister compounded of double catholicon, rhubarb, honey of roses, and other ingredients according to the prescription, to scour, work, and clear out the bowels of Mr. Argon, thirty sous. With your leave, ten sous. Item on the said day, in the evening, a julep, hepatic, soporiferous, and somniferous, intended to promote the sleep of Mr. Argon, thirty-five sous. I do not complain of that, for it made me sleep very well. Ten, fifteen, sixteen, and seventeen sous six deniers. Item. On the twenty-fifth, a good purgative and corroborative mixture, composed of fresh cassia with levantine senna and other ingredients according to the prescription of Mr. Pergan, to expel Mr. Argan's bile, four francs. You are joking, Mr. Florent. You must learn to be reasonable with patience. Mr. Purgon never ordered you to put four francs. Tut! Put three francs, if you please. Twenty, thirty sous. Item. On the said day, a dose, anodyne and astringent, to make Mr. Argon sleep. Thirty sous. Ten sous, Mr. Florent. Item. On the twenty-sixth, a carminative cloister to cure the flatulence of Mr. Argon. Thirty sous. Item. The cloister repeated in the evening is above. Thirty sous. Ten sous, Mr. Florent. Item. On the twenty-seventh, a good mixture composed for the purpose of driving out the bad humors of Mr. Argon. Three francs. Good. Twenty and thirty sous. I am glad that you are reasonable. Item. On the 28th, a dose of clarified and edulcorated whey to soften, lenify, temper, and refresh the blood of Mr. Argon. 20 sous. Good. 10 sous. Item. A potion, cordial and preservative, composed of 12 grains of bezoar, syrup of citrons and pomegranates, and other ingredients according to the prescription. 5 francs. Ah, Mr. Florent, gently, if you please. If you go on like that, no one will wish to be unwell. Be satisfied with four francs. Twenty-four sous. Three and two are five, and five are ten, and 
Ten or twenty. Sixty-three francs, four sous, six deniers. So that during this month I have taken one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight mixtures. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve clysters. And last month there were twelve mixtures and twenty clysters. I am not astonished, therefore, that I am not so well this month as last. I shall speak to Mr. Pergon about it, so that he may set the matter right. Come, let all this be taken away. He sees that no one comes, and he is alone. Nobody. It's no use. I am always left alone. There's no way of keeping them here. He rings a handbell. They don't hear, and my bell doesn't make enough noise. He rings again. No one. He rings again. Toinette. He rings again. It's just as if I didn't ring at all. You hussy. You jade. He rings again. Confound it all. He rings and shouts. Deuce take you, you wretch. Scene two. Argon, Toinette. Coming. Coming. Ah, you jade, you wretch. Pretending to have knocked her head. Ah, bother your impatience. You hurry me so much that I have knocked my head against the window shutter. You vixen! Oh! There is... Oh! For the last hour I... Oh! You have left me... Oh! Be silent, you baggage, and let me scold you. Well, that's too bad after what I have done to myself. You make me bawl till my throat is sore, you jade. And you? You made me break my head open. One is just as bad as the other. So, with your leave, we are quits. What? You, hussy! If you go on scolding me, I shall cry. To leave me, you... Oh! You would... Oh! What? Shall I have also to give up the pleasure of scolding her? Well, scold as much as you please. Do as you like. Oh, you prevent me, you hussy, by interrupting me every moment. If you have the pleasure of scolding, I surely can have that of crying. Let every one have his fancy, tis but right. Oh, oh. I must give it up, I suppose. Take this away. Take this away, you jade. Be careful to have some broth ready for the other that I am to take soon. This Mr. Fleuron and Mr. Pergon amuse themselves finely with your body. They have a rare milch cow in you, I must say. And I should like them to tell me what disease it is you have for them to physic you so. Hold your tongue, simpleton. It is not for you to control the decrees of the faculty. Ask my daughter Angelique to come to me. I have something to tell her. Here she is, coming of her own accord. She must have guessed your thoughts. Scene three. Argon, Angelique, Tonnet. You come just in time. I want to speak to you. I am quite ready to hear you. Wait a moment. To Tonette. Give me my walking stick. I'll come back directly. Go, sir. Go quickly. Mr. Florent gives us plenty to do. Scene four. Angelique. Tonette. Toinette? Well, what? Look at me a little. Well, I am looking at you. Toinette. Well, what, Toinette? Don't you guess what I want to speak about? Oh, yes, I have some slight idea that you want to speak of our young lover, for it is of him we have been speaking for the last six days, and you are not well unless you mention him at every turn. Since you know what it is I want, why are you not the first to speak to me of him? And why do you not spare me the trouble of being the one to start the conversation? You don't give me time, and you are so eager that it is difficult to be beforehand with you on the subject. I acknowledge that I am never weary of speaking of him, and that my heart takes eager advantage of every moment I have to open my heart to you. But tell me, Toinette, do you blame the feelings I have towards him? I am far from doing so. Am I wrong in giving way to these sweet impressions? I don't say that you are. And would you have me insensible to the tender protestations of ardent love which he shows me? Heaven forbid! Tell me, do you not see, as I do, something providential, some act of destiny in the unexpected adventure from which our acquaintance originated? 
Yes. That it is impossible to act more generously. Agreed. And that he did all this with the greatest possible grace. Oh, yes. Do you not think, Toinette, that he is very handsome? Certainly. That he has the best manners in the world? No doubt about it. That there is always something noble in what he says and what he does? Most certainly. That there never was anything more tender than all he says to me? True. And that there can be nothing more painful than the restraint under which I am kept, for it prevents all sweet intercourse, and puts an end to that mutual love with which heaven has inspired us. You are right. But, dear Toinette, tell me, do you think that he loves me as much as he says he does? Hum, that's a thing hardly to be trusted at any time. A show of love is sadly like the real thing, and I have met with very good actors in that line. Ah, Toinette, what are you saying there? Alas, judging by the manner in which he speaks, is it possible that he is not telling the truth? At any rate, you will soon be satisfied on this point, and the resolution which he says he has taken of asking you in marriage is a sure and ready way of showing you if what he says is true or not. That is the all-sufficient proof. Ah, Toinette, if he deceives me, I shall never in all my life believe in any man. Here is your father coming back. Scene 5. Argon, Angelique, Toinette. I say, Angelique, I have a piece of news for you which perhaps you did not expect. You have been asked of me in marriage. Hello, how is that? You are smiling. Quite as pleasant, is it not, that word marriage? There is nothing so funny to young girls. Ah, nature, nature. So, from what I see, daughter, there is no need of my asking you if you are willing to marry. I ought to obey you in everything, father. I am very glad to possess such an obedient daughter. The thing is settled, then, and I have promised you. It is my duty, father, blindly to follow all you determine upon for me. My wife, your mother-in-law, wanted me to make a nun of you and of your little sister, Louison, also. She has always been bent upon that. Aside. The excellent creature has her reasons. She would not consent to this marriage, but I carried the day, and my word is given. Really, I am pleased with you for that, and it is the wisest thing you ever did in your life. I have not seen the person in question, but I am told that I shall be satisfied with him, and that you too will be satisfied. Most certainly, father. How? Have you seen him, then? Since your consent to our marriage authorizes me to open my heart to you, I will not hide from you that chance made us acquainted six days ago, and that the request which has been made to you is the result of the sympathy we felt for one another at first sight. They did not tell me that, but I am glad of it. It is much better that things should be so. They say that he is a tall, well-made young fellow. Yes, father. Of a fine build. Yes, indeed. Pleasant. Certainly. A good face. Very good. Steady and of good family. Quite. With very good manners. The best possible. And speaks both Latin and Greek. Ah, that I don't know anything about. And that he will in three days be made a doctor. He, father? Yes. Did he not tell you? No, indeed. Who told you? Uh, Mr. Pergon. Does Mr. Pergon know him? What a question. Of course he knows him, since he is his nephew. Cleant is the nephew of Mr. Pergon? What Cleant? We are speaking about him who has asked you in marriage. Yes, of course. Well... He is the nephew of Mr. Pergon, and the son of his brother-in-law, Mr. Diaphorus. And this son is called Thomas Diaphorus, and not Cleant. Mr. Florent and I decided upon this match this morning, and tomorrow this future son-in-law will be brought to me by his father. What is the matter? You look all scared. It is because, father, I see that you have been speaking of one person, and I of another. What? Sir, you have formed such a queer project as that, and with all the wealth you possess, you want to marry your daughter to a doctor? What business is it of yours, you impudent jade? Gently, gently. You always begin by abuse. 
can we not reason together without getting into a rage come let us speak quietly what reason have you if you please for such a marriage my reason is that seeing myself infirm and sick i wish to have a son-in-law and relatives who are doctors in order to secure their kind assistance in my illness to have in my family the fountainhead of those remedies which are necessary to me and to be within reach of consultations and prescriptions very well at least that is giving a reason and there is a certain pleasure in answering one another calmly but now sir on your conscience do you really and truly believe that you are ill believe that i am ill you jade believe that i am ill you impudent hussy very well then sir you are ill don't let us quarrel about that yes you are very ill i agree with you upon that point more ill even than you think now is that settled but your daughter is to marry a husband for herself and as she is not ill what is the use of giving her a doctor it is for my sake that i give her this doctor and a good daughter ought to be delighted to marry for the sake of her father's health in good troth sir shall i as a friend give you a piece of advice what is this advice not to think of this match and your reason the reason is that your daughter will never consent to it my daughter will not consent to it no my daughter your daughter she will tell you that she has no need of mr diaforu nor of his son mr thomas diaforu nor all the diaforuses in the world but i have need of them besides the match is more advantageous than you think mr diaphorus has only this son for his heir and moreover mr pergon who has neither wife nor child gives all he has in favor of this marriage and mr pergon is a man worth eight thousand francs a year what a lot of people he must have killed to have become so rich well, eight thousand francs is something without counting the property of the father that is very well sir but all the same i advise you between ourselves to choose another husband for her she is not of a make to become a mrs diaforu but i will have it so fie nonsense don't speak like that don't speak like that why not dear me no don't and why should i not speak like that people will say that you don't know what you're talking about people will say all they like but i tell you that i will have her make my promise good i feel sure that she won't then i will force her to do it she will not do it i tell you she will or i will shut her up in a convent you i good how good you will not shut her up in a convent i shall not shut her up in a convent no 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 well this is cool i shall not put my daughter in a convent if i like no i tell you and who will hinder me you yourself myself you will never have the heart to do it i shall you are joking i am not joking fatherly love will hinder you it will not hinder me a little tear or two her arms thrown round your neck or my darling little papa said very tenderly will be enough to touch your heart all that will be useless oh yes i tell you that nothing will move me rubbish you have no business to say rubbish i know you well enough you are naturally kind-hearted i am not kind-hearted and i am ill-natured when i like gently sir you forget that you are ill i command her to prepare herself to take the husband i have fixed upon and i decidedly forbid her to do anything of the kind what have we come to and what boldness is this for a scrub of a servant to speak in such a way before a master when a master does not consider what he is doing a sensible servant should set him right running after tanette ah impudent girl i will kill you avoiding argon and putting the chair between her and him it is my duty to oppose what would be a dishonor to you running after tanette with his cane in his hand come here come here let me teach you how to speak running to the opposite side of the chair i interest myself in your affairs as i ought to do and i don't wish to see you commit any folly jade no i will never consent to this marriage 
worthless hussy. I won't have her marry your Thomas dear Foru. Vixen! She will obey me sooner than you. Angelique, won't you stop that jade for me? Ah, oh, father, don't make yourself ill. If you don't stop her, I will refuse you my blessing. Going away. And I will disinherit her if she obeys you. Throwing himself into his chair. Ah, I am done for. It is enough to kill me. Scene six. Beline Argon. Ah, come near, my wife. What ails you, my poor dear husband? Come to my help. What is the matter, my little darling child? My love. My love. They have just put me in a rage. Alas, my poor little husband, how was that, my own dear pet? Ah, that jade of yours, Toinette, has grown more insolent than ever. Don't excite yourself. She has put me in a rage, my dove. Gently, my child. She has been thwarting me for the last hour about everything I want to do. There, there, never mind. And has had the impudence to say that I am not ill. She is an impertinent hussy. You know, my soul, what the truth is. Yes, my darling, she is wrong. My own dear, that jade will be the death of me. Now, don't, don't. She is the cause of all my bile. Don't be so angry. And I have asked you ever so many times to send her away. Alas, my child, there is no servant without defects. We are obliged to put up at times with their bad qualities on account of their good ones. The girl is skillful, careful, diligent, and, above all, honest. And you know that in our days we must be very careful what people we take into our house. I say, Toinette. Scene 7. Argon, Berlin, Toinette. Madame? How is this? Why do you put my husband in a passion? I, madame? Alas, I don't know what you mean, and my only aim is to please master in everything. Ah, the deceitful girl! He said to us that he wished to marry his daughter to the son of Mr. Diafouru. I told him that I thought the match very advantageous for her, but that I believed he would do better to put her in a convent. There is not much harm in that, and I think that she is right. Ah, dearie, do you believe her? She is a vile girl and has said a hundred insolent things to me. Well, I believe you, my dear. Come, compose yourself. And you, Toinette, listen to me. If ever you make my husband angry again, I will send you away. Come, give me his fur cloak and some pillows, that I may make him comfortable in his armchair. You are all anyhow. Pull your nightcap right down over your ears, there is nothing that gives people such bad colds as letting in the air through the ears. Ah, dearie, how much obliged I am to you for all the care you take of me. Adjusting the pillows, which she puts round him. Raise yourself a little for me to put this under you. Let us put this one for you to lean upon, and this one on the other side. This one behind your back, and this other to support your head. Clapping a pillow rudely on his head. And this other to keep you from the evening damp. Rising angrily, and throwing the pillows after Tonette, who runs away. Ah, wretch, you want to smother me. Scene 8. Argon, Berlin. Now, now, what is it again? Throwing himself in his chair. Ah, I can hold out no longer. But why do you fly into such a passion? She thought she was doing right. You don't know, darling, the wickedness of that villainous baggage. She has altogether upset me, and I shall want more than eight different mixtures and twelve injections to remedy the evil. Come, come, my dearie, compose yourself a little. Lovey, you are my only consolation. Poor little pet. To repay you for all the love you have for me, my darling, I will, as I told you, make my will. Ah, my soul, do not let us speak of that, I beseech you. I cannot bear to think of it, and the very word will makes me die of grief. I had asked you to speak to our notary about it. There he is, close at hand. I have brought him with me. Well, make him come in, then, my life. Alas, my darling, when a woman loves her husband so much, she finds it almost impossible to think of these things. Scene 9. 
Monsieur de Bonnefoy, Béline, Argon. Come here, Mr. de Bonnefoy. Come here. Take a seat, if you please. My wife tells me, sir, that you are a very honest man, and altogether one of her friends. I have therefore asked her to speak to you about a will which I wish to make. Alas, I cannot speak of those things. She has fully explained to me your intentions, sir, and what you mean to do for her. But I have to tell you that you can give nothing to your wife by will. But why so? It is against custom. If you were in a district where statute law prevailed, the thing could be done. But in Paris, and in almost all places governed by custom, it cannot be done, and the will would be held void. The only settlement that man and wife can make on each other is by mutual donation while they are still alive and even then there must be no children from either that marriage or any previous marriage at the deceased of the first who dies well, it's a very impertinent custom that a husband can leave nothing to a wife whom he loves by whom he is tenderly loved and who takes so much care of him i should like to consult my own advocate to see what i can do it is not to an advocate that you must apply for they are very particular on this point and think it a great crime to bestow one's property contrary to the law they are people to make difficulties and are ignorant of the by-laws of conscience there are others whom you may consult with advantage on that point and who have expedients for gently overriding the law and for rendering just that which is not allowed these know how to smooth over the difficulties of an affair and to find the means of eluding custom by some indirect advantage without that what would become of us every day we must make things easy otherwise we should do nothing and i wouldn't give a penny for our business well my wife had rightly told me sir that you were a very clever and honest man what can i do pray to give her my fortune and deprive my children of it what you can do you can discreetly choose a friend of your wife to whom you will give all your own in due form by your will and that friend will give it up to her afterwards or else you can sign a great many safe bonds in favour of various creditors who will lend their names to your wife and in whose hands they will leave a declaration that what was done was only to serve her you can also in your lifetime put in her hands ready money and bills which you can make payable to the bearer alas you must not trouble yourself about all that if i lose you my child i will stay no longer in the world my darling yes my pet if i were unfortunate enough to lose you my dear wifey life would be nothing to me my love and i would follow you to the grave to show you all the tenderness i feel for you you will break my heart dearie comfort yourself i beseech you these tears are unseasonable things have not come to that yet ah sir you don't know what it is to have a husband one loves tenderly all the regret i shall have if i die my darling will be to have no child from you. Mr. Pergon told me he would make me have one. That may come still. I must make my will, dearie, according to what this gentleman advises. But, out of precaution, I will give you the twenty thousand francs in gold which I have in the wainscoting of the recess of my room, and two bills payable to bearer which are due to me, one for Mr. Damon, the other for mr gerant no no i will have nothing to do with all that 
Ha! Huh. How much do you say there is in the recess? Uh, Twenty thousand francs, darling. Don't speak to me of your money, I beseech you. Ha! Huh. How much are the two bills for? One, my love, is for four thousand francs, and the other for six thousand. All the wealth in the world, my soul, is nothing to me compared to you. Shall we draw up the will? Well, yes, sir, but we shall be more comfortable in my own little study. Help me, my love. Come, my poor dear child. Scene 10. Angelique. Tonette. They are shut up with the notary, and I heard something about a will. Your mother-in-law doesn't go to sleep. It is no doubt some conspiracy of hers against your interests to which she is urging your father. Let him dispose of his money as he likes, as long as he does not dispose of my heart in the same way. You see, Toinette, to what violence it is subjected. Do not forsake me, I beseech you, in this my extremity. I forsake you. I had rather die. In vain does your stepmother try to take me into her confidence and make me espouse her interests. I never could like her, and I have always been on your side. Trust me, I will do everything to serve you. But in order to serve you more effectually, I shall change my tactics, hide my wish to help you, and affect to enter into the feelings of your father and your stepmother. Try, I beseech you, to let Cléant know about the marriage they have decided upon. I have nobody to employ for that duty but the old usurer Puncinello, my lover. It will cost me a few honeyed words, which I am most willing to spend for you. Today it is too late for that, but tomorrow morning early I will send for him, and he will be delighted to. Scene 11. Baline, in the house. Angelique, Toinette. Toinette? I am called away. Good night. Trust me. End of Act 1. Act Two of The Imaginary Invalid by Moliere. Translated by Charles Heron Wall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Two, Scene One. Cleant, Toinette. Not recognizing Cleant. What is it you want, sir? What do I want? Ah, ah, is it you? What a surprise. What are you coming here for? To learn my destiny, to speak to the lovely Angelique, to consult the feelings of her heart, and to ask what she means to do about this fatal marriage of which I have been told. Very well. But no one speaks so easily as all that to Angelique. You must take precautions, and you have been told how narrowly she is watched. She never goes out, nor does she see anybody. It was through the curiosity of an old aunt that we obtained leave to go to the play where your love began, and we have taken good care not to say anything about it. Ah, therefore I am not here as Cléante, nor as her lover, but as the friend of her music-master, from whom I have obtained leave to say that I have come in his stead. Here is her father. Withdraw a little, and let me tell him who you are. Scene 2. Argon, Tonnette. Thinking himself alone. Mr. Pergan told me that I was to walk twelve times to and fro in my room every morning, but I forgot to ask him whether it should be lengthwise or across. Sir, here is a gentleman. Speak in a lower tone, you jade. You split my head open, and you forget that we should never speak so loud to sick people. I wanted to tell you, sir. Speak low, I tell you. Sir... She moves her lips as if she were speaking. What? I tell you that... As before. What is it you say? I say that there is a gentleman here who wants to speak to you. Well, let him come in. Scene 3. Argon, Cliente, Toinette. Sir? Do not speak so loud for fear of splitting open the head of Mr. Argon. Sir, I am delighted to find you up and to see you better. How? Better? It is false. Master is always ill. I had heard that your master was better, and I think he looks well in the face. What do you mean by his looking well in the face? He looks very bad, and it is only impertinent folks who say that he is better. He never was so ill in his life. She is right. 
he walks sleeps eats and drinks like other folks but that does not hinder him from being very ill quite true i am heartily sorry for it sir i am sent by your daughter's music master he was obliged to go into the country for a few days and as i am his intimate friend he has asked me to come here in his place to go on with the lessons for fear that if they were discontinued she should forget what she has already learnt very well to tonette call angelique i think sir it would be better to take the gentleman to her room no make her come here he cannot give her a good lesson if they are not left alone oh yes he can sir it will stun you and you should have nothing to disturb you in the state of health you are in no no i like music and i should be glad to ah here she is to tonette go and see if my wife is dressed scene four argon angelique cliente come my daughter your music master is gone into the country and here is a person whom he sends instead to give you your lesson recognizing cliente oh heavens well, what is the matter why this surprise it is what can disturb you in that manner it is such a strange coincidence how so i dreamt last night that i was in the greatest trouble imaginable and that someone exactly like this gentleman came to me i asked him to help me and presently he saved me from the great trouble i was in my surprise was very great to meet unexpectedly on my coming here him of whom i had been dreaming all night it is no small happiness to occupy your thoughts whether sleeping or waking and my delight would be great indeed if you were in any trouble out of which you would think me worthy of delivering you there is nothing that i would not do for scene five argon angelique cliente tonette indeed sir i am of your opinion now and i unsay all that i said yesterday here are mr diaphoru the father and mr diaphoru the son who are coming to visit you how well provided with a son-in-law you will be you will see the best made young fellow in the world and the most intellectual he said but two words to me it is true but i was struck with them and your daughter will be delighted with him to cliente who moves as if to go do not go sir i am about as you see to marry my daughter and they have just brought her future husband whom she has not as yet seen you do me great honour sir in wishing me to be witness of such a pleasant interview he is the son of a clever doctor and the marriage will take place in four days huh, indeed well, please inform her music master of it that he may be at the wedding i will not fail to do so oh, and i invite you also oh, you do me too much honour come make room here they are scene six Monsieur Diaphorius, Thomas Diaphorius, Argon, Angelique, Cliant, Toinette, servants. Putting up his hand to his nightcap without taking it off. Mr. Pergon has forbidden me to uncover my head. You belong to the profession, and know what would be the consequence if I did so. We are bound in all our visits to bring relief to invalids and not to injure them. Monsieur Argon and monsieur diaphoria speak at the same time uh, i receive sir we come here sir with great joy my son thomas and myself the honour you do me to declare to you sir and i wish the delight we are in i could have gone to your house at the favour you do us to assure you of it in so kindly admitting us but you know sir to the honour sir what it is to be a poor invalid of your alliance who can only and assure you tell you here that in all that depends on our knowledge that he will seize every opportunity as well as in any other way to show you sir that we shall ever be ready sir that he is entirely at your service to show you our zeal now thomas come forward and pay your respects ought i not to begin with the father yes sir I come to salute, acknowledge, cherish, and revere in you a second father, but a second father to whom I owe more 
I make bold to say, than to the first. The first gave me birth, but you have chosen me. He received me by necessity, but you have accepted me by choice. What I have from him is of the body, corporal. What I hold from you is of the will, voluntary. And in so much the more as the mental faculties are above the corporal, in so much the more do I hold precious this future affiliation for which I come beforehand today to render you my most humble and respectful homage. Long life to the colleges which send such clever people into the world. Has this been said to your satisfaction, father? Optime. Come bow to this gentleman. Shall I kiss? Yes, yes. To Angelique. Madame, it is with justice that heaven has given you the name of stepmother. Since we see in you steps toward the perfect beauty which... It is not to my wife, but to my daughter that you are speaking. Where is she? She will soon come. Shall I wait, father, till she comes? No. Go through your compliments to the young lady in the meantime. Madame. As the statue of Memnon gave forth a harmonious sound when it was struck by the first rays of the sun, in like manner do I experience a sweet rapture at the apparition of this sun of your beauty. As the naturalists remark that the flower-styled heliotrope always turns toward the star of day, so will my heart forever turn towards the resplendent stars of your adorable eyes as to its only pole. Suffer me then, madame to make today on the altar of your charms the offering of a heart which longs for and is ambitious of no greater glory than to be till death madame your most humble most obedient most faithful servant and husband ah see what it is to study and how one learns to say fine things well what do you say to that the gentleman does wonders and if he is as good a doctor as he is an orator it will be most pleasant to be one of his patients certainly it will be something admirable if his cures are as wonderful as his speeches now quick my chair and seats for everybody servants bring chairs well sit down here my daughter you see sir that everybody admires your son and i think you very fortunate in being the father of such a fine young man sir it is not because i am his father but i can boast that I have reason to be satisfied with him, and that all those who see him speak of him as of a youth without guile. He has not a very lively imagination, nor that sparkling wit which is found in some others. But it is this which has always made me augur well of his judgment, a quality required for the exercise of our art. As a child he never was what is called sharp or lively. He was always gentle, peaceful, taciturn, never saying a word, and never playing at any of those little pastimes that we call children's games. It was found most difficult to teach him to read, and he was nine years old before he knew his letters. A good omen, I used to say to myself. Trees slow of growth bear the best fruit. We engrave on marble with much more difficulty than on sand, but the result is more lasting and that dullness of apprehension, that heaviness of imagination, is a mark of a sound judgment in the future. When I sent him to college, he found it hard work, but he stuck to his duty and bore up with obstinacy against all difficulties. His tutors always praised him for his assiduity and the trouble he took. In short, by dint of continual hammering, he at last succeeded gloriously in obtaining his degree. And I can say without vanity that from that time till now there has been no candidate who has made more noise than he in all the disputations of our school. There he has rendered himself formidable, and no debate passes but he goes and argues loudly and to the last extreme on the opposite side. He is firm in dispute, strong as a Turk in his principles, never changes his opinion, and pursues an argument to the last recesses of logic. But, above all things, what pleases me in him, and what I am glad to see him follow my example in, is that he is blindly attached to the opinions of the ancients, 
and that he would never understand nor listen to the reasons and the experiences of the pretended discoveries of our century concerning the circulation of the blood and other opinions of the same stamp. Pulling out of his pocket a long paper rolled up and presenting it to Angelique. I have upheld against these circulators a thesis which, with the permission of this gentleman, I venture to present to the young lady as the first fruits of my genius. Sir, it is a useless piece of furniture to me. I do not understand these things. Taking the paper. Never mind. Give it all the same. The picture will be of use, and we will adorn our attic with it. With the permission of this gentleman, I invite you to come one of these days to amuse yourself by assisting at the dissection of a woman upon whose body I am to give lectures. The treat will be most welcome. There are some who give the pleasure of seeing a play to their lady love, but a dissection is much more gallant. Moreover, in respect to the qualities required for marriage, I assure you that he is all you could wish, and that his children will be strong and healthy. Do you not intend, sir, to push his way at court, and obtain for him the post of physician there? To tell you the truth, I have never had any predilection to practice with the great. It never seemed pleasant to me, and I have found that it is better for us to confine ourselves to the ordinary public. Ordinary people are more convenient. You are accountable to nobody for your actions. And as long as you follow the common rules laid down by the faculty, there is no necessity to trouble yourself about the result. What is vexatious among people of rank is that when they are ill, they positively expect their doctor to cure them. How very absurd! How impertinent of them to ask of you doctors to cure them! You are not placed near them for that, but only to receive your fees and to prescribe remedies. It is their own lookout to get well if they can. Quite so. We are only bound to treat people according to form. Sir, please make my daughter sing before the company. I was waiting for your commands, sir and i propose in order to amuse the company to sing with the young lady an operetta which has lately come out there's your part mine don't refuse pray but let me explain to you what is the scene we must sing i have no voice but in this case it is sufficient if i make myself understood and you must have the goodness to excuse me because i am under the necessity of making the young lady sing are the verses pretty it is really nothing but a small extempore opera, and what you will hear is only rhythmical prose or a kind of irregular verse, such as passion and necessity make two people utter. Very well, let us hear. The subject of the scene is as follows. A shepherd was paying every attention to the beauties of a play, when he was disturbed by a noise close to him and on turning round he saw a scoundrel who with insolent language was annoying a young shepherdess he immediately espoused the cause of a sex to which all men owe homage and after having chastised the brute for his insolence he came near the shepherdess to comfort her he sees a young girl with the most beautiful eyes he has ever beheld who is shedding tears which he thinks the most precious in the world alas says he to himself can any one be capable of insulting such charms where is the unfeeling wretch the barbarous man to be found who will not feel touched by such tears he endeavors to stop those beautiful tears and the lovely shepherdess takes the opportunity of thanking him for the slight service he has rendered her but she does it in a manner so touching so tender and so passionate the shepherd cannot resist it, and each word, each look, is a burning shaft which penetrates his heart. Is there anything in the world worthy of such thanks? And what will not one do, what service and what danger will not one be delighted to run to attract upon oneself, even for a moment, the touching sweetness of so grateful a heart? The whole play was acted without his paying any more attention to it. Yet he complains that it was too short since the end separates him from his lovely shepherdess from that moment from that first night he carries away with him a love which has the strength of a passion of many years he now feels all the pangs of absence 
and is tormented in no longer seeing what he beheld for so short a time. He tries every means to meet again with a sight so dear to him, and the remembrance of which pursues him day and night, but the great watch which is kept over his shepherdess deprives him of all the power of doing so. The violence of his passion urges him to ask in marriage the adorable beauty without whom he can no longer live, and he obtains from her the permission of doing so by means of a note that he has succeeded in sending to her. But he is told in the meantime that the father of her whom he loves has decided upon marrying her to another, and that everything is being got ready to celebrate the wedding. Judge what a cruel wound for the heart of that poor shepherd! Behold him suffering from this mortal blow! He cannot bear the dreadful idea of seeing her he loves in the arms of another! And in his despair he finds the means of introducing himself into the house of his shepherdess, in order to learn her feelings and to hear from her the fate he must expect. There he sees everything ready for what he fears. He sees the unworthy rival whom the caprice of a father opposes to the tenderness of his love. He sees that ridiculous rival triumphant near the lovely shepherdess, as if already assured of his conquest. Such a sight fills him with a wrath he can hardly master. He looks despairingly at her whom he adores, but the respect he has for her and the presence of her father prevent him from speaking, except with his eyes. At last he breaks through all restraint, and the greatness of his love forces him to speak as follows. If, if, <clears throat> Phyllis, to sharp a pain you bid me bear. Break this stern silence, tell me what to fear. Disclose your thoughts and bid them open lie. To tell me if I live or die. The marriage preparations sadden me, o'erwhelmed with sorrow, mine eyes I lift to heaven, I strive to pray, then gaze on you and sigh, no more I say. Dear cease, who fain would woo, tell him Phyllis, is it true, is he so blessed by your sweet grace? as in your heart to find a place i may not hide it in this dire extreme tersus i own for you my love o oh, blessed words am i indeed so blessed repeat them phyllis set my doubts at rest i love you tersus oh phyllis once again I love you, Tersus. Alas, I fain a hundred times would hearken to that strain. I love you, I love you, Tersus, I love you. Ye kings and gods who from your eternal seat behold the world of men beneath your feet, can you possess a happiness more sweet? my phyllis one dark haunting fear one peaceful joy disturbs unsought a rival may your homage share ah worse than death is such a thought its presence equal torment is to both and mars my bliss your father to his vow would subject you Ah, welcome death before I prove untrue. And what does the father say to all that? Then that father is a fool to put up with those silly things without saying a word. Ah, my love! No, no, that will do. An opera like that is in very bad taste. The shepherd, Tersus, is an impertinent fellow, and the shepherdess, Phyllis, an impudent girl, to speak in that way in the presence of her father. Show me that paper. Ah, ah, 
And where are the words that you have just sung? This is only the music. Are you not aware, sir, that the way of writing the words with the notes themselves has been lately discovered? Has it? Good-bye for the present. We could have done very well without your impertinent opera. Oh, I thought I should amuse you. Foolish things do not amuse, sir. Ah, here is my wife. Scene 7. Béline, Argon, Angelique, Monsieur D'Euphorius, Thomas D'Euphorius, Toinette. My love, here is the son of Mr. Diaphorus. Madame, it is with justice that heaven has given you the title of stepmother, since we see in you steps. Sir, I am delighted to have come here just in time to see you. Since we see in you, since we see in you, Madame, you have interrupted me in the middle of my period, and have troubled my memory. Keep it for another time. I wish, my dear, that you had been here just now. Ah, Madame, how much you have lost by not being at the second father, the statue of Memnon, and the flower-styled heliotrope. Well, come, my daughter, shake hands with this gentleman, and pledge him your troth. Father? Well, what do you mean by father? I beseech you not to be in such a hurry. Give us time to become acquainted with each other, and to see grow in us that sympathy so necessary to a perfect union. As far as I am concerned, madame, it is already full-grown within me, and there is no occasion for me to wait. I am not so quick as you are, sir, and I must confess that your merit has not yet made enough impression on my heart. Oh, nonsense! There will be time enough for the impression to be made after you are married. Ah, oh, my father, give me time, I beseech you. Marriage is a chain which should never be imposed by force. And if this gentleman is a man of honor, he ought not to accept a person who would be his only by force. Nego consquentium. I can be a man of honor, madame, and at the same time accept you from the hands of your father. To do violence to anyone is a strange way of setting about inspiring love. We read in the ancients, madame, that it was their custom to carry off by main force from their father's house the maiden they wished to marry, so that the latter might not seem to fly of her own accord into the arms of a man. The ancients, sir, are the ancients, but we are the moderns. Pretenses are not necessary in our age, and when a marriage pleases us, we know very well how to go to it without being dragged by force. Have a little patience. If you love me, sir, you ought to do what I wish. Certainly, madame, but without prejudice to the interest of my love. But the greatest mark of love is to submit to the will of her who is loved. Distinguo, madame, in what does not regard the possession of her, concedo, but in what regards it, nego. It is in vain for you to argue. This gentleman is brand new from the college, and will be more than a match for you. Why resist and refuse the glory of belonging to the faculty? She may have some other inclination in her head. If I had, madam, it would be such as reason and honor allow. Heyday! I am acting a pleasant part here. If I were you, my child, I would not force her to marry. I know very well what I should do. I know what you mean, madam, and how kind you are to me. But it may be hoped that your advice may not be fortunate enough to be followed. That is because well-brought-up and good children, like you, scorn to be obedient to the will of their fathers. Obedience was all very well in former times. The duty of a daughter has its limits, madam, and neither reason nor law extend it to all things. Which means that your thoughts are all in favor of marriage, but that you will choose a husband for yourself. If my father will not give me a husband I like, at least I beseech him not to force me to marry one I can never love. Gentlemen, I beg your pardon for all this. We all have our own end in marrying. For my part, as I only want a husband that I can love sincerely, and as I intend to consecrate my whole life to him, I feel bound, I confess, to be cautious. There are some who marry simply to free themselves from the yoke of their parents, and to be at liberty to do all they like. There are others, madam, who see in marriage only a matter of mere interest, who marry only to get a settlement, and to enrich themselves by the death of those they marry. 
they pass without scruple from husband to husband, with an eye to their possessions. These, no doubt, madam, are not so difficult to satisfy, and care little what the husband is like. You are very full of reasoning to-day. I wonder what you mean by this. I, madam, what can I mean but what I say? You are such a simpleton, my dear, that one can hardly bear with you. You would like to extract from me some rude answer, but I warn you that you will not have the pleasure of doing so. Nothing can equal your impertinence. It is of no use, madam, you will not. And you have a ridiculous pride, an impertinent presumption, which makes you the scorn of everybody. All this will be useless, madam. I shall be quiet in spite of you, and to take away from you all hope of succeeding in what you wish, I will withdraw from your presence. Scene 8 Argon, Berlin, Monsieur Diophorius, Thomas Diophorius, Tonette. To Angelique as she goes away. Listen to me. Of two things, one. Either you will marry this gentleman, or you will go into a convent. I give you four days to consider. To Berlin. Don't be anxious. I will bring her to reason. I am sorry to leave you, my child, but I have some important business which calls me to town. I shall soon be back. Go, my darling. Call upon the notary and tell him to be quick about you know what. Goodbye, my child. Goodbye, dearie. Scene nine. Argon, Monsieur Diophorius, Thomas Diophorius, Toinette. How much this woman loves me! It is perfectly incredible. We shall now take our leave of you, sir. I beg of you, sir, to tell me how I am. Feeling Argon's pulse. Now, Thomas. Take the other arm of the gentleman, so that I may see whether you can form a right judgment on his pulse. Quid dicis? Dico, that the pulse of this gentleman is the pulse of a man who is not well. Good. That is, Duriusculus, not to say Durus. Very well. Irregular. Bene. And even a little caprison. Optime. Which speaks of an intemperance in the splenetic parenchyma that is to say the spleen quite right why it cannot be for mr purgon says that it is my liver which is out of order certainly he who says parenchyma says both one and the other because of the great sympathy which exists between them through the means of the vas brave of the pylorus and often of the meatus colidici he no doubt orders you to eat plenty of roast meat no nothing but boiled meat yes yes roast or boiled it is all the same he orders very wisely and you could not have fallen into better hands sir tell me how many grains of salt i ought to put to an egg six eight ten by even numbers just as in medicines by odd numbers good-bye sir i hope soon to have the pleasure of seeing you again scene ten Berlin, Argon. Before I go out, I must inform you of one thing you must be careful about. While passing before Angelique's door, I saw with her a young man, who ran away as soon as he noticed me. A young man with my daughter? Yes, your little girl Louison, who was with them, will tell you all about it. Send her here, my love, and send her here at once. Ah, the brazen-faced girl! I no longer wonder at the resistance she showed. Scene 11. Argon, Louison. What do you want, papa? My stepmamma told me to come to you. Yes, come here. Come nearer. Turn round and hold up your head. Look straight at me. Well? What, papa? So? What? Have you nothing to say to me? Yes. I will, to amuse you, tell you, if you like, the story of the ass's skin, or the fable of the fox and the crow, which I have learnt lately. That is not what I want of you. What is it, then? Ah, uh, cunning little girl, you know very well what I mean. No, indeed, papa. Is that the way you obey me? What, papa? Have I not asked you to tell me at once all you see? Yes, papa. Have you done so? Yes, papa, I always come and tell you all I see. And have you seen nothing to-day? No, papa. No? 
No, papa. Quite sure? Quite sure. Ah, indeed. I will make you see something soon. Seeing Argon take a rod. Oh, papa. Ah, ah, false little girl. You do not tell me that you saw a man in your sister's room. Papa. <laughs> Taking Louison by the arm. This will teach you to tell falsehoods. Throwing herself on her knees. Oh, my dear papa, pray forgive me. My sister had asked me not to say anything to you, but I will tell you everything. First, you must have a flogging for having told an untruth. Then we will see to the rest. Forgive me, papa, forgive me. No, no. My dear papa, don't whip me. Yes, you shall be whipped. For pity's sake, don't whip me, papa. Going to whip her. Come, come. Oh, papa, you have hurt me. I am dead. She feigns to be dead. How now? What does this mean? Louison, Louison, ah, heaven, Louison, my child, ah, wretched father. My poor child is dead. What have I done? Ah, villainous rod, a curse on the rod. Ah, my poor child, my dear little Louison. Come, come, dear papa, don't weep so. I am not quite dead yet. Just see the cunning little wench. Well, I forgive you this once, but you must tell me everything. Oh, yes, dear papa. Be sure you take great care, for here is my little finger that knows everything, and it will tell me if you don't speak the truth. But, papa, you won't tell sister that I told you. No, no. After having listened to see if anyone can hear, Papa, a young man came into sister's room while I was there. Well? I asked him what he wanted. He said that he was her music master. Hmm, hmm, I see. Well? Then sister came. Well? She said to him, Go away, go away, go. Good heavens, you will drive me to despair. Well? But he would not go away. What did he say to her? Oh, ever so many things. But what? He told her this and that and the other, that he loved her dearly, that she was the most beautiful person in the world. And then, after? Then he knelt down before her. And then? Then he kept on kissing her hands. And then? Then my mamma came to the door and he escaped. Nothing else? No, dear papa. Here is my little finger which says something, though. Putting his finger up to his ear. Wait. Stay, eh? Ah, ah, yes. Oh, oh. Here is my little finger, which says that there is something you saw, and which you do not tell me. Ah, oh, papa, your little finger is a storyteller. Take care. No, don't believe him. He tells a story, I assure you. Oh, well, well, we will see to that. Go away now and pay great attention to what you see. Ah, children are no longer children nowadays. What trouble! I have not even enough leisure to attend to my illness. I am quite done up. He falls down into his chair. Scene 12. Moralde. Argon. Well, brother, what is the matter? How are you? Ah, very bad, brother. Very bad. How is that? No one would believe how very feeble I am. Well, that's a sad thing indeed. I have hardly enough strength to speak. I came here, brother, to propose a match for my niece, Angelique. In a rage, speaking with great fury, and starting up from his chair. Brother, don't speak to me of that wicked, good-for-nothing, insolent, brazen-faced girl. I will put her in a convent before two days are over. <laughs> All right. I am glad to see that you have a little strength still left, and that my visit does you good. Well, well, we will talk of business by and by. 
I have brought you an entertainment, which will dissipate your melancholy and will dispose you better for what we have to talk about. They are gypsies, dressed in Moorish clothes. They perform some dances mixed with songs, which I am sure you will like, and which will be as good as a prescription from Mr. Pergon. Come along. End of Act Two. Act Three of The Imaginary Invalid by Moliere. Translated by Charles Heron Wall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Act Three, Scene One. Feraldi, Algon, Tonette. Well, brother, what do you say to that? Isn't it as good as a dose of cassia? Oh, good cassia is a very good thing, sir. Now, shall we have a little chat together? Wait a moment, brother. I'll be back directly. Here, sir, you forget that you cannot get about without a stick. Oh, aye, uh, to be sure. Scene two. Parald, Tonette. Pray, do not give up the interest of your niece. No, I shall do all in my power to forward her wishes. We must prevent this foolish marriage which he has got into his head from taking place. And I thought to myself that it would be a good thing to introduce a doctor here, having a full understanding of our wishes, to disgust him with this Mr. Pergan, and to abuse his mode of treating him. But as we have nobody to act that part for us, I have decided upon playing him a trick of my own. In what way? Oh, it is rather an absurd idea, and it may be more fortunate than good. But act your own part. Here is our man. Scene three. Argon Borade. Let me ask you, brother, above all things, not to excite yourself during our conversation. I agree. To answer without anger to anything I may mention. Very well. And to reason together upon the business I want to discuss with you without any irritation. Dear me! Yes, what a preamble! How is it, brother? that with all the wealth you possess, and with only one daughter, for I do not count the little one, you speak of sending her to a convent. How is it, brother, that I am master of my family, and that I can do all I think fit? Your wife doesn't fail to advise you to get rid in that way of your two daughters, and I have no doubt that through a spirit of charity she would be charmed to see them both good nuns. Oh, I see. My poor wife again. It is she who does all the harm, and everybody is against her. Oh, no, brother, let us leave that alone. She is a woman with the best intentions in the world for the good of your family, and is free from all interested motives. She expresses for you the most extraordinary tenderness, and shows toward your children an inconceivable goodness. No, don't let us speak of her, but only of your daughter. What can be your reason for wishing to give her in marriage to the sort of a doctor? My reason is that I wish to have a son-in-law who will suit my wants. But it is not what your daughter requires, and we have a more suitable match for her. Yes, but this one is more suitable for me. But does she marry a husband for herself, or for you, brother? He must do both for her and for me, brother. And I wish to take into my family people of whom I have need. Uh, so that if your little girl were old enough, you would give her to an apothecary? Why not? Is it possible that you should always be so infatuated with your apothecaries and doctors and be so determined to be ill in spite of men and nature? What do you mean by that, brother? I mean, brother, that I know of no man less sick than you, and that I should be quite satisfied with a constitution no worse than yours. One great proof that you are well, and that you have a body perfectly well made, is that with all the pains you have taken you have failed as yet in injuring the soundness of your constitution, and that you have not died of all the medicine they have made you swallow. But are you aware, brother, 
that it is these medicines which keep me in good health. Mr. Pergon says that I should go off it if he were but three days without taking care of me. If you are not careful, he will take such care of you that he will soon send you into the next world. But let us reason together, brother. Don't you believe at all in medicine? No, brother, and I do not see that it is necessary for our salvation to believe in it. What? Do you not hold true a thing acknowledged by everybody and revered throughout all ages? Between ourselves, far from thinking it true, I look upon it as one of the greatest follies which exist among men. And to consider things from a philosophical point of view, I don't know of a more absurd piece of mummery of anything more ridiculous than a man who takes upon himself to cure another man. Why will you not believe that a man can cure another? For the simple reason, brother, that the springs of our machines are mysteries about which men are as yet completely in the dark, and nature has put too thick a veil before our eyes for us to know anything about it. Then, according to you, the doctors know nothing at all. Oh, yes, brother. Most of them have some knowledge of the best classics, can talk fine Latin, can give a Greek name to every disease, can define and distinguish them. But as to curing these diseases, that's out of the question. Still, you must agree to this, that doctors know more than others. They know, brother, what I have told you, and that does not affect many cures. All the excellency of their art consists in pompous gibberish, in a specious babbling which gives you words instead of reasons and promises instead of results. Still, brother, there exist men as wise and clever as you, and we see that in cases of illness, every one has recourse to the doctor. It is a proof of human weakness and not of the truth of their art. Still, doctors must believe in their art since they make use of it for themselves. It is because some of them share the popular error by which they themselves profit, while others profit by it without sharing it. Your Mr. Burgon has no wish to deceive. He is a thorough doctor from head to foot, a man who believes in his rules more than in all the demonstrations of mathematics, and who would think it a crime to question them. He sees nothing obscure in physic, nothing doubtful, nothing difficult and through an impetuous prepossession and obstinate confidence of course common sense and reason orders right and left purgatives and bleedings and hesitates at nothing we must bear him no ill will for the harm he does us it is with the best intentions in the world that he will send you into the next world and in killing you he will do no more than he has done to his wife and children and than he would do to himself if need be it is because you have a spite against him. But let us come to the point. What is to be done when one is ill? Nothing, brother. Nothing? Nothing. Only rest. Nature, when we leave her free, will herself gently recover from the disorder into which she has fallen. It is our anxiety, our impatience, which does the mischief, and most men die of their remedies and not of their diseases. Still, you must acknowledge, brother, that we can in certain things help nature. Alas, brother, these are pure fancies with which we deceive ourselves. At all times there have crept among men brilliant fancies in which we believe because they flatter us, and because it would be well if they were true. When a doctor speaks to us of assisting, succoring nature, of removing what is injurious to it, of giving it what it is defective in, of restoring it, and giving back to it the full exercise of its functions, when he speaks of purifying the blood, of refreshing the bowels and the brain, of correcting the spleen, of rebuilding the lungs, of renovating the liver, of fortifying the heart, of re-establishing and keeping up the natural heat, and of possessing secrets wherewith to lengthen life of many years, he repeats to you the romance of physic. But when you test the truth of what he has promised to you, you will find it all ends in nothing. It is like those beautiful dreams which only leave you in the morning the regret of having believed in them. 
which means that all the knowledge of the world is contained in your brain, and that you think you know more than all the great doctors of our age put together. When you weigh words and actions, your great doctors are two different kinds of people. Listen to their talk. They are the cleverest people in the world. See them at work, and they are the most ignorant. Heyday, you are a great doctor, I see. And I wish that some one of those gentlemen were here to take up your arguments and to check your babble. I do not take upon myself, brother, to fight against physic. And every one at their own risk and peril may believe what he likes. What I say is only between ourselves. And I should have liked, in order to deliver you from the error into which you have fallen, and in order to amuse you, to take you to see some of Moliere's comedies on this subject. Oh, your Moliere is a fine, impertinent fellow with his comedies. I think it mightily pleasant of him to go and take off honest people like the doctors. It is not the doctors themselves that he takes off, but the absurdity of medicine. It becomes him well, truly, to control the faculty. He's a nice simpleton, and a nice impertinent fellow to laugh at consultations and prescriptions, to attack the body of physicians, and to bring on his stage such venerable people as those gentlemen. What would you have him bring there but the different professions of men? Princes and kings are brought there every day, and they are of as good a stock as your physicians. No, by all the devils. If I were a physician, I would be revenged of his impertinence. And when he falls ill, I would let him die without relief. In vain would he beg and pray. I would not prescribe for him the least little bleeding, the least little injection. And I would tell him, die, die like a dog. It will teach you to laugh at us, doctors. You are terribly angry with him. Yes, he is an ill-advised fellow, and if the doctors are wise, they will do what I say. He will be wiser than the doctors, for he will not go and ask their help. So much the worse for him, if he has not recourse to their remedies. He has his reasons for not wishing to have anything to do with them. He is certain that only strong and robust constitutions can bear their remedies in addition to the illness, and he has only just enough strength for his sickness. What absurd reasons! Here, brother, don't speak to me any more about that man, for it makes me savage, and you will give me his complaint. I will willingly cease, brother. And to change the subject, allow me to tell you that because your daughter shows a slight repugnance to the match you propose, it is no reason why you should shut her up in a convent. In your choice of a son-in-law, you should not blindly follow the anger which masters you. You should, in such a matter, yield a little to the inclinations of a daughter, since it is for all her life, and the whole happiness of her married life depends on it. Scene 4. Monsieur Florent, Argon, Borald. Ah, brother, with your leave. Eh? What are you going to do? Oh, to take this little cloister. It will soon be done. Are you joking? Can you not spend another moment without cloisters or physic? Put it off to another time and be quiet. Well, Mr. Florent, let it be for tonight or tomorrow morning. What right have you to interfere? How dare you oppose yourself to the prescription of the doctors? and prevent the gentleman from taking my cloister. You are a nice fellow to show such boldness. Go, sir, go. It is easy to see that you are not accustomed to speak face to face with men. You ought not thus to sneer at physic, and make me lose my precious time. I came here for a good prescription, and will go and tell Monsieur Purgon that I have been prevented from executing his orders and that I have been stopped in the performance of my duty. You'll see. You'll see. Scene 5. Argon Borald. Brother, you'll be the cause that some misfortune will happen here. What a misfortune not to take a cloister prescribed by Mr. Purgon. 
Once more, brother, is it possible that you can't be cured of this doctor disease, and that you will thus bring yourself under their remedies? Ah, brother, you speak like a man who is quite well. But if you were in my place, you would soon change your way of speaking. It is easy to speak against medicine when one is in perfect health. But what disease do you suffer from? You will drive me to desperation. I should like you to have my disease, and then we should see if you would prate as you do. Ah, here is Mr. Purgon. Scene 6. Monsieur Purgon, Argon, Borald, Tonnette. I have just heard nice news downstairs. You laugh at my prescriptions and refuse to take the remedy which I ordered. But, sir, it is not. What daring boldness! What a strange revolt of a patient against his doctor! It is frightful. A clyster, which I have had the pleasure of composing myself. It was not I. Invented and made up according to all the rules of art. He was wrong and which was to work a marvellous effect on the intestines my brother to send it back with contempt it was he such conduct is monstrous so it is it is a fearful outrage against medicine he is the cause a crime of high treason against the faculty and one which cannot be too severely punished you are quite right i declare to you that i break off all intercourse with you it is my brother that i will have no more connection with you you will do quite right and to end all association with you here is the deed of gift which i made to my nephew in favor of the marriage he tears the document and throws the pieces about furiously it is my brother who has done all the mischief to despise my cloister let it be brought i will take it directly I would have cured you in a very short time. He doesn't deserve it. I was about to cleanse your body and to clear it of its bad humors. Ah, my brother. And it wanted only a dozen purgatives to cleanse it entirely. He's unworthy of your care. But since you would not be cured by me. It was not my fault. Since you have forsaken the obedience you owe to your doctor. It cries for vengeance. Since you have declared yourself a rebel against the remedies I had prescribed for you. No, no, certainly not. I must now tell you that I give you up to your bad constitution, to the intemperament of your intestines, to the corruption of your blood, to the acrimony of your bile, and to the feculence of your humors. It serves you right. Alas! and i will have you before four days in an incurable state ah mercy on me you shall fall into bradypepsia mr purgon from bradypepsia to dyspepsia mr purgon from dyspepsia to apopepsy mr purgon from apopepsy into lientery mr purgon from lientery into dysentery mr purgon from dysentery into dropsy. Mr. Purgon! And from dropsy to the deprivation of life into which your folly will bring you. Scene 7. Argon Morad. Ah, heaven! I am dead. Brother, you have undone me. Why? What is the matter? I am undone. I feel already that the faculty is avenging itself. Really, brother, you are crazy. And I would not for a great deal that you should be seen acting as you are doing. Shake yourself a little. I beg, recover yourself. And do not give way so much to your imagination. You hear, brother, with what strange diseases he has threatened me. What a foolish fellow you are. He says that I shall become incurable within four days. And what does it signify what he says? Is it an oracle that has spoken? To hear you, anyone would think that Mr. Purgon holds in his hands the thread of your life, and that he has supreme authority to prolong it or to cut it short at his will. Remember that the springs of your life are in yourself, 
and that all the wrath of Mr. Purgon can do as little towards making you die as his remedies can do to make you live. This is an opportunity, if you like to take it, of getting rid of your doctors, and if you are so constituted that you cannot do without them, it is easy for you, brother, to have another with whom you run less risk. Ah, brother, he knows all about my constitution and the way to treat me. I must acknowledge that you are greatly infatuated and that you look at things with uh, strange eyes. Scene 8. Argon, Tonette, Brad. There is a doctor here, sir, who desires to see you. What doctor? I'm a doctor of medicine. I ask you who he is. I don't know who he is, but he is as much like me as two peas, and if I was not sure that my mother was an honest woman, I should say that this is a little brother she has given me since my father's death. Scene 9. Argon, Brad. You have served according to your wish. One doctor leaves you, another comes to replace him. I greatly fear that you will cause some misfortune. Oh, are you harping on that string again? Ah, I have on my mind all those diseases that I don't understand, those... Scene 10. Argon, Borald, Tonette, dressed as a doctor. Allow me, sir, to come and pay my respects to you, and to offer you my small services for all the bleedings and purging you may require. I am much obliged to you, sir. To Borald. Toinette herself, I declare... I beg you will excuse me one moment, sir. I forgot to give a small order to my servant. Scene 11. Argon, Parade. Would you not say that this is really Toinette? It is true that the resemblance is uh, very striking, but it is not the first time that we have seen this kind of thing, and history is full of those freaks of nature. For my part, I am astonished and... Scene 12. Argon, Parade. Tonette. What do you want, sir? What? Did you not call me? I? No. My ears must have tinkled then. Just stop here one moment and see how much that doctor is like you. Ah, yes, indeed. I have plenty of time to waste. Besides, I have seen enough of him already. Scene 13. Argon, Borald. Had I not seen them both together, I should have believed it was one and the same person. I have read wonderful stories about such resemblances, and we have seen some in our day that have taken in everybody. For my part, I should have been deceived this time, and sworn that the two were but one. Scene 14. Argon, Borald, Tonette, as a doctor. Sir, I beg your pardon with all my heart. Oh, it is wonderful. You will not take amiss, I hope, the curiosity I feel to see such an illustrious patient, and your reputation, which reaches the farthest ends of the world, must be my excuse for the liberty I am taking. Sir, I am your servant. I see, sir, that you are looking earnestly at me. What age do you think I am? I should think twenty-six or twenty-seven, at the utmost. Ah, ah, ha, ha, ha. I am ninety years old. Ninety years old? Yes, this is what the secrets of my art have done for me to preserve me fresh and vigorous, as you see. Upon my word, a fine youthful old fellow of ninety. I am an itinerant doctor and go from town to town, from province to province, from kingdom to kingdom, to seek out illustrious material for my abilities, to find patients worthy of my attention, capable of exercising the great and noble secrets which I have discovered in medicine. I disdain to amuse myself with the small rubbish of common diseases, with the trifles of rheumatism, coughs, fevers, vapours, and headaches. I require diseases of importance, such as good non-intermittent fevers with delirium, good scarlet fevers, good plagues, good confirmed dropsies, good pleurisies with inflammations of the lungs. These are what I like, what I triumph in, and I wish, sir, that you had all those diseases combined, that you had been given up, despaired of by all the doctors, and at the point of death, 
so that i might have the pleasure of showing you the excellency of my remedies and the desire i have of doing you service i am greatly obliged to you sir for the kind intentions you have towards me let me feel your pulse come come beat properly please ah i will soon make you beat as you should this pulse is trifling with me i see that it does not know me yet who is your doctor a mr purgon that man is not noted in my books among the great doctors what does he say you are ill of he says it is the liver and others say it is the spleen <laughs> they are a pack of ignorant blockheads you are suffering from the lungs the lungs yes what do you feel from time to time great pains in my head just so the lungs at times it seems as if i had a mist before my eyes the lungs i feel sick now and then the lungs and i feel sometimes a weariness in all my limbs the lungs and sometimes i have sharp pains in the stomach as if i had the colic the lungs do you eat your food with appetite yes sir the lungs do you like to drink a little wine yes sir the lungs you feel sleepy after your meals and willingly enjoy a nap yes sir the lungs the lungs i tell you what does your doctor order you for food he orders me soup ignoramus fowl ignoramus veal ignoramus broth ignoramus new laid eggs ignoramus and at night a few prunes to relax the bowels ignoramus and above all to drink my wine well diluted with water ignorantus ignoranta ignorantum you must drink your wine pure and to thicken your blood which is too thin you must eat good fat beef good fat pork good dutch cheese some gruel rice puddings chestnuts and thin cakes to make all adhere and conglutinate your doctor is an ass i will send you one of my own school and will come and examine you from time to time during my stay in this town you will oblige me greatly what the deuce do you want with this arm what if i were you i should have cut it off on the spot why don't you see that it attracts all the nourishment to itself and hinders this side from growing maybe but i have need of my arm you have also a right eye that i would have plucked out if i were in your place my right eye plucked out don't you see that it interferes with the other and robs it of its nourishment believe me have it plucked out as soon as possible you will see all the clearer with the left eye uh, there is no need to hurry good-bye i am sorry to leave you so soon but i must assist the grand consultation which is to take place about a man who died yesterday about a man who died yesterday yes that we may consider and see what ought to have been done to cure him good-bye you know that patients do not use ceremony scene fifteen argon broad upon my word this doctor seems to be a very clever man yes but he goes a little too fast all great doctors do so cut off my arm and pluck out my eyes so that the other may be better i had rather that it were not better a nice operation indeed to make me at once one-eyed and one-armed scene sixteen argon vorald tenet pretending to speak to somebody come come i am your servant i am in no joking humour what is the matter your doctor forsooth who wanted to feel my pulse just imagine and that too at fourscore and ten years of age now i say brother since you have quarrelled with mr burgon won't you give me leave to speak of the match which is proposed for my niece no brother i will put her in a convent since she has rebelled against me i see plainly that there is some love business at the bottom of it all and i have discovered a certain secret interview which they don't suspect me to know anything about well brother and suppose there were some little inclination what could the harm be would it be so criminal when it all tends to what is honourable marriage 
Be that as it may, she will be a nun. I have made up my mind. You intend to please somebody by so doing. I understand what you mean. You always come back to that. And my wife is very much in your way. Well, yes, brother, since I must speak out, it is your wife I mean. For I can no more bear with your infatuation about doctors than with your infatuation about your wife, and see you run headlong into every snare she lays for you. Ah, sir, don't talk so of mistress. She is a person against whom there is nothing to be said, a woman without deceit, and who loves master. Ah, who loves him. I can't express how much. To Berald. Just ask her all the caresses she lavishes for me. Yes, indeed. And all the uneasiness my sickness causes her. Certainly. And the care and trouble she takes about me. Quite right. To Berald. Will you let me convince you, and to show you at once how my mistress loves my master? To Argon. Sir, allow me to undeceive him, and to show him his mistake. How? My mistress will soon come back. Stretch yourself full length in this armchair, and pretend to be dead. You will see what grief she will be in when I tell her the news. Very well. I consent. Yes, but don't leave her too long in despair, for she might die of it. Trust me for that. To Barald. Hide yourself in that corner. Scene 17. Argon, Tonnette. Is there no danger in counterfeiting death? No, no. What danger can there be? Only stretch yourself there. It will be so pleasant to put your brother to confusion. Here is my mistress. Mind you keep still. Scene 18. Beline, Argon, stretched out in his chair. Tonnette. Pretending not to see Beline. Ah, oh, heavens! Ah, oh, what a misfortune! What a strange accident! What is the matter, Toinette? Ah, madame! What ails you? Your husband is dead. My husband is dead? Alas, yes. The poor soul is gone. Are you quite certain? Quite certain. Nobody knows of it yet. I was all alone here when it happened. He has just breathed his last in my arms. Here, just look at him, full length in his chair. Heaven be praised! I am delivered from a most grievous burden. How silly of you, Toinette, to be so afflicted at his death. Ah, madame, I thought I ought to cry. Pooh, it is not worth the trouble. What loss is it to anybody? And what good did he do in this world? A wretch, unpleasant to everybody, of nauseous, dirty habits, always a clister or a dose of physic in his body, always snivelling, coughing, spitting, a stupid, tedious, ill-natured fellow, who was for ever fatiguing people and scolding night and day at his maids and servants. An excellent funeral oration. Toinette, you must help me to carry out my design, and you may depend upon it, that I will make it worth your while if you serve me. Since, by good luck, nobody is aware of his death, let us put him into his bed and keep the secret until I have done what I want. There are some papers and some money I must possess myself of. It is not right that I should have passed the best years of my life with him without any kind of advantage. Come along, Toinette. First of all, let us take all the keys. Getting up hastily. Softly. Ah! <gasps> So, my wife, it is thus you love me? Ah, the dead man is not dead. To Beline, who goes away. I am very glad to see how you love me, and to have heard the noble panegyric you have made upon me. This is a good warning which will make me wise for the future, and prevent me from doing many things. Scene 19. Perald, coming out of the place where he was hiding. Argon, Tonette. Well, brother, you see... Now, really, I could never have believed such a thing. But I hear your daughter coming. Place yourself as you were just now, and let us see how she will receive the news. It is not a bad thing to try, and since you have begun, you will be able by this means to know the sentiments of your family towards you. Scene 20. Argon, Angelique, Tonette. 
pretending not to see angelique oh heavens what a sad accident what an unhappy day what ails you toinette and why do you cry alas i have such sad news for you what is it your father is dead my father is dead toinette yes just look at him there he died only a moment ago of a fainting fit that came over him oh heavens what a misfortune what a cruel grief alas why must i lose my father the only being left me in the world and why should i lose him too at a time when he was angry with me what will become of me unhappy girl that i am what consolation can i find after so great a loss scene twenty one argon angelique cliente tonette what is the matter with you dear angelique and what misfortune makes you weep alas i weep for what was most dear and most precious to me i weep for the death of my father oh heaven what a misfortune what an unforeseen stroke of fortune alas after i had asked your uncle to ask you in marriage i was coming to see him in order to try by my respect and entreaties to incline his heart to grant you to my wishes ah cleant let us talk no more of this let us give up all hopes of marriage now my father is dead i will have nothing to do with the world and will renounce it for ever yes my dear father if i resisted your will i will at least follow out one of your intentions and will by that make amends for the sorrow i have caused you kneeling let me father make you this promise here and kiss you as a proof of my repentance kissing angelique ah my daughter ah come do not be afraid i am not dead ah you are my true flesh and blood and my real daughter I am delighted to have discovered your good heart. Scene 22. Argon, Borald, Angelique, Cliente, Tonette. Ah, what a delightful surprise! Father, since heaven has given you back to our love, let me here throw myself at your feet to implore one favor of you. If you do not approve of what my heart feels, if you refuse to give me Cliente for a husband, I conjure you at least not to force me to marry another. It is all I have to ask of you. Throwing himself at Argon's feet. Ah! Sir, allow your heart to be touched by her entreaties and by mine, and do not oppose our mutual love. Brother, how can you resist all this? Will you remain insensible before such affection? Well, let him become a doctor, and I will consent to the marriage. Yes, turn doctor, sir, and I will give you my daughter very willingly sir if it is all that is required to become your son-in-law I, I will turn doctor uh, apothecary also if you like it's not such a difficult thing after all and i would do much more to obtain from you the fair angelique uh, but brother it just strikes me why don't you turn doctor yourself it would be much more convenient to have all you want within yourself quite true that is the very way to cure yourself there is no disease bold enough to dare to attack the person of a doctor. I imagine, brother, that you are laughing at me. Can I study at my age? Study? <laughs> what need is there? You are clever enough for that. There are a great many who are not a bit more clever than you are. But one must be able to speak Latin well and know the different diseases and the remedies they require. When you put on the cap and gown of a doctor, all that will come of itself, and you will afterwards be much more clever than you care to be. What? We understand how to discourse upon diseases when we have that dress? Yes, you have only to hold forth when you have a cap and gown. Any stuff becomes learned, and all rubbish good sense. Look you, sir, a beard is something in itself. A beard is half the doctor anyhow i'm ready for everything shall we have the thing done immediately how immediately yes in your house in my house yes i know a body of physicians friends of mine who will come presently and will perform the ceremony in your hall it will cost you nothing but what can i say what can i answer you will be instructed in a few words and they will give you in writing all you have to say Go and dress yourself directly, and I will send for them. Very well. 
Let it be done. Scene 23. Rald, Angelique, Cleant. What is it you intend to do, and what do you mean by this body of physicians? What is it you are going to do? To amuse ourselves a little tonight. The players have made a doctor's admission the subject of an interlude with dances and music. I want everyone to enjoy it, and my brother to act the principal part in it. But, Uncle, it seems to me that you are making fun of my father. But, niece, it is not making too much fun of him to fall in with his fancies. We may each of us take part in it ourselves, and thus perform the comedy for each other's amusement. Carnival time authorizes it. Let us go quickly and get everything ready. Do you consent to it? Yes, since my uncle takes the lead. End of Act Three End of The Imaginary Invalid by Moliere Translated by Charles Heron Wall